Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Paul Lieva. I'm an assistant professor in neurology under Yale School of Medicine and a stroke neurologist serving our community here in Greenwich. Today, I will talk about stroke prevention. That is preventing a first and second stroke from happening. I would like to remind everyone that this is a recording. So please hold your questions until the very end of this session. Let us begin. I have no disclosures for this talk. The purpose of this talk is to provide an update about the epidemiology and talk about strategies to prevent a first stroke and preventing another stroke. In this lecture, I will talk about the epidemiology of stroke. I will discuss risk factors for stroke, factors that can be changed and treated, and these are the modifiable risk factors, and factors that are non-modifiable. This, this will be followed by secondary stroke prevention strategies, that is, preventing another stroke from happening. This will include medical management of stroke, such as blood pressure control, anti-thrombotic therapy, cholesterol-lowering therapy, and a glycemic control. Of note, this lecture will focus solely on medical management of stroke and will not include surgical interventions. I will also insert cases between topics to put factual information into perspective. So in our country, about 800,000 people have a stroke each year, and astoundingly, 77% are first events. There are two types of strokes, ischemic and hemorrhagic. Ischemic strokes result from a clot blocking the artery of the brain. A hemorrhagic stroke or bleed results from a blood vessel in the brain ruptures. Most strokes are the ischemic type representing about 87% of cases. Stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States following heart disease, cancer, lung diseases, and accidents. This is actually improved as stroke used to be the third leading cause of death just about a decade ago. Nevertheless, stroke remains the leading cause of serious long-term disability in the United States. Stroke mortality is particularly higher by 30% in the stroke belt region of the country. And these states include North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and Arkansas. The stroke mortality rates are also higher in non-Hispanic Blacks. And of those of, uh, who survive stroke, about half have moderate to severe disability, which means a good portion of stroke survivors will suffer from language or speech impairment, gait disability, and cognitive impairment. A portion of survivors will need to be placed in institutions such as nursing home. Stroke tr tremendously impacts the economy, not just the individual. A cost of stroke is estimated at 18.8 billion in 2008 with lost productivity and premature mortality adding an additional 15.5 billion. So the primary prevention of stroke really focuses on the identification and modification of risk factors. And this includes recognizing and treating modifiable risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes mellitus, atrial fibrillation, dyslipidemia, smoking, sedentary lifestyle, kidney disorders, sleep apnea, heavy alcohol use, and a silent killer, which is diet. There are risk factors that unfortunately is innate, such as male sex, genetic susceptibility, and age. So the first modifiable risk factor that we'll tackle is hypertension. So hypertension is highly prevalent and conveys a significant risk of stroke. High blood pressure has been implicated in both ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. 
Hypertension can lead to thickening of arteries and contribute to plaque deposits in the arteries. And this is what you see in the image on the right. Hypertension can lead to thickening of arteries and plaque deposits. Hypertension can also lead to changes within the artery, which is a process called lipohyalinosis. Based on a new guideline, hypertension is now defined by a blood pressure more than 130 over 80. Multiple studies have demonstrated a benefit to reducing blood pressure to less than 140 over 85. Strokes are caused by hypertension. We call this small vessel strokes, as elevated blood pressure can affect the small arteries of the brain. A more aggressive goal of systolic blood pressure of less than 130 reduced hemorrhagic stroke risk by 63%. In patients with diabetes, reducing systolic blood pressure to less than 120 reduced risk of stroke by 41%. Hence, regular blood pressure screening is critical for identifying hypertension and affecting early intervention. Patients with hypertension should be treated with lifestyle and medical therapy to achieve a blood pressure of less than 130 over 80. So here's a case of a 65-year-old male with um, hypertension and chronic kidney disease. He went to his primary care provider and, and found to have a blood pressure of 180 over 95. He lived alone and spent most of his days watching TV and snacks while watching. He ate predominantly cold cuts and chips for most of his meals. So if this case fits your profile, here are the steps that need to be taken to prevent a stroke. The first step should be lifestyle intervention. Patients with hypertension should increase physical activity by engaging in some type of exercises at least 30 minutes per day, and that's three to four times per week. Dietary modification is advised, such as adopting the Mediterranean or dietary approaches to stop hypertension diet or DASH diet. Blood pressure should be rechecked frequently with a home monitor and at follow-up visits. According to the current guidelines, if blood pressure remains elevated, an antihypertensive should be initiated with a goal of achieving a blood pressure of less than 130 over 80. So the next modifiable st stroke risk factor is diabetes. Diabetes mellitus is an independent risk factor for stroke. High blood sugar can directly and indirectly damage blood vessels and nerves. Young patients and women with diabetes are at risk for ischemic stroke. The duration of diabetes mellitus of more than three years increases the risk of stroke by 74%. And to monitor control of blood sugar, a blood parameter called hemoglobin A1C is checked periodically by primary care physicians or providers. And it is recommended that hemoglobin A1C should be less than 7% to prevent microvascular complications of type 2 diabetes. However, intensive glucose control is not recommended as it can lead to hypoglycemia and frequent hospitalization. Intensive glucose control also does not appear to reduce stroke risk. So another stroke risk factor is atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is an important mechanism of stroke, particularly in the elderly. Atrial fibrillation can lead to disturbance of blood flow within the heart and can predispose to clot formation. As you can see on the right, uh, if the heartbeat is irregular, it leads to blood flow stagnation and hence increased risk for clot formation. The prevalence of atrial fibrillation increases with age and women are at higher risk of having a stroke due to atrial fibrillation. There are various types of atrial fibrillation paroxysmal or permanent, they should be treated the same way as both convey similar risk for stroke. Oral blood thinners um, with direct oral anticoagulants such as the Bigatran, Vivaroxaban, Apixaban, Edoxaban, or Warfarin can significantly reduce the risk of stroke by as much as 80%. The risk of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation can be assessed by using a scoring system called chads to vas score, which really stands for congestive heart failure, hypertension, age 75 years or older. 
diabetes mellitus, stroke, vascular disease, age between 65 to 74 years, and sex category, particularly female sex. A corresponding number is assigned for every risk factor, with 10 being the highest. The higher the number, the greater the risk. Anticoagulation is recommended for patients with CHADS2 VAST score of one or greater, unless the score is solely based on the female sex, in which case another risk factor is required. And here's another case. A 70-year-old female with hypertension, diabetes, mild chronic kidney disease, who was found to be in atrial fibrillation on routine EKG performed at primary care physician's office. Her creatinine was 1.1 milligrams per deciliter, and she weighed 61.2 kilograms. So based on her risk factor, she was given a CHADS2 VAST score of five, which means that she has a five to 10% annual risk for stroke. And based on her weight, age, and renal function, she was started on one of the newer blood thinners called Apixaban or Eliquis at five milligrams twice a day. So the next risk factor is dyslipidemia. High levels of cholesterol and low density lipoprotein predispose to ischemic stroke. High cholesterol does, does so as it promotes deposition of plaques to the arteries. Diet and lifestyle changes are the first step in reducing stroke risk. Statins such as atorvastatin or rosuvastatin should be considered. Individual baseline risk and patient preference are considered with regards to use of statins. Patients who have had the stroke should have an LDL goal of less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. We will discuss this later and under uh, uh, secondary stroke prevention. So the next uh, risk factor for stroke is smoking. Active smoking increases the risk of stroke two to four times. Smoking increases the formation of plaque in blood vessels. The chemicals in cigarette smoke can also cause blood to thicken and form clots inside veins and arteries. Smoking cessation is definitely effective in reducing risk and can be achieved through counseling in combination with medications such as nicotine replacement, use of bupropion, or varenicline. Passive exposure to secondhand smoke also increases stroke risk by 25%. So try to stay away from smokers. And here's another case, uh, a 30 year old female with history of cerebral aneurysm and migraine headache. She was an active smoker and uh, smoked one pack of cigarettes per day for the last 10 years and drank two to three alcoholic beverages per day. So this patient's profile, which includes cerebral aneurysm, puts her at risk for both hemorrhaging and ischemic stroke as cigarette smoking can also lead to intracranial bleeding. During the visit, the patient should receive counseling on the importance of smoking cessation and be provided with a referral to a smoking cessation program as well as medical options to help her quit. She should also be advised to limit alcohol consumption to no more than one alcoholic beverage per day. Sedentary lifestyle. Physical inactivity is a risk factor for stroke. Sedentary behavior can increase your risk of dying either from heart disease or other medical problems. There have been numerous studies that demonstrated the protective effect of physical activity. Engage in exercise if you can. Moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic exercise for at least 30 minutes a day, three to four times a week is recommended. And some examples of moderate intensity physical activity include brisk walking, dancing, gardening, housework, traditional hunting and gathering, active involvement in games and sports with children, general building tasks such as painting, carrying or moving moderate loads less than 20 kilograms. So some examples of vigorous intensity physical activity include running, climbing briskly up a hill, fast cycling, aerobics, swimming, competitive sports, heavy shoveling, and carrying heavy loads of uh, more than 20 kilograms. Kidney disease is also a risk factor for stroke. It can lead to high blood pressure and also increases the risk of plaque and clot formation. 
Patients with chronic kidney disease is five to 30 times higher to develop ischemic stroke, especially patients on dialysis. Blood pressure control is particularly important to prevent stroke in this population. So the next uh, risk factor is sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a common condition and has been associated with stroke. Some of the symptoms of sleep apnea include easy fatigability and sleepiness during the day. In a doctor's office, screening scales such as Epworth sleepiness scale can be used to screen patients who may be considered for a sleep test. If untreated, sleep apnea can also lead to hypertension, death due to heart disease, insulin resistance, and glucose tolerance leading to diabetes. It has been associated with development of heart conditions such as atrial fibrillation, thereby increasing risk of stroke. Too much alcohol intake is definitely a risk. The association between alcohol consumption and ischemic stroke is described as J-shaped in that the risk of stroke is higher with abstinence versus low intake, which is one drink per day for women and less than or equal to two drinks per day for men. Heavy alcohol use is associated with intracerebral hemorrhage, which is the CT head image that you see here on the right. Here you see a white density um, within the core of the brain, which, is, which represents blood and is associated with rupture of an artery in the brain. People who do not drink alcohol are not encouraged to start and people who drink heavily are advised to limit intake. So last but certainly not the least is diet, the silent killer. <clears throat> a diet rich in fruits and vegetables may be beneficial in reducing risk of stroke. The DASH diet or dietary approaches to stop hypertension diet and Mediterranean diets appear to provide a protective effect. These diets emphasize on fruits, vegetables, fish, legumes, and white meat, low sodium and high in potassium. Low sodium means not exceeding a teaspoon or 2,300 milligrams of salt per day. It is recommended that you seek the assistance of a nutritionist for proper dietary advice and planning if you need to. All right, now let's switch gears and let's talk about secondary stroke prevention, which are strategies to prevent another stroke from happening. The high risk of recurrent stroke after an ischemic stroke justifies an early and aggressive approach to secondary stroke prevention so that these risks can be modified before another stroke can occur. And as I have mentioned earlier, 80 to 90% of strokes are preventable. The risk of recurrent events is particularly high in the first hours and days after an initial ischemic event. A high sense of urgency is needed to ensure that patients with stroke are rapidly evaluated so that properly targeted and optimized secondary prevention measures can be applied. A system of care to provide longitudinal management is important so that further optimizations can be applied and the ongoing challenges of adherence and tolerability of medications can be addressed. To prevent another stroke, it is again very important to address risk factors that can be modified. And we will discuss the medical management for secondary stroke prevention which includes antihypertensive therapy, use of antiplatelets or anticoagulants, cholesterol lowering therapy, medications to manage diabetes mellitus, and insulin resistance. So I can never stress enough the importance of blood pressure control for stroke prevention. Of all the major behavioral, environmental, occupational, and metabolic risk factors, Elevated systolic blood pressure is the leading risk factor for global disease burden, and a substantial portion of these burdens is due to stroke. Hypertension is an important target for secondary stroke prevention because it is particularly prevalent among those with a history of stroke or TIA. It plays a major role in promoting atherosclerotic disease and is strongly associated with an elevated risk of stroke. Achieving modest reductions in blood pressure has been shown to substantially decrease stroke risk. The evidence to support the use of antihypertensive therapy for secondary stroke prevention is, is based on extrapolations from primary stroke prevention studies. 
A few of these trials have shown that a reduction in diastolic blood pressure of just five millimeter mercury achieved primarily with uh, diuretics or beta blockers led to a 42% reduction in stroke risk. The overall efficacy of blood pressure control. And one of these trials is called the PROGRESS trial, which compared the use of an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, uh, in this case it's perindopril, with or without a diuretic, and reported a 28% relative risk reduction in recurrent stroke. The benefit was concentrated in patients who received both antihypertensive agents because these patients achieved greater blood pressure reductions. Now, the other trial is PATS, or a post-stroke antihypertensive treatment study, which assigned a diuretic, in this case it's indapamide, versus placebo, and showed a 29% decrease in recurrent stroke with treatment. So the choice of antihypertensive agent should be individualized and depends on the presence of conditions such as coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, diabetes mellitus, chronic kidney disease, or asthma. The timing or starting of starting or restarting antihypertensive agents after a stroke usually poses a, a clinical dilemma. The management of hypertension is different after an acute ischemic stroke uh, compared to primary prevention of stroke. Blood pressure control after a stroke should be individualized depending on the clinical status of the patient. After a stroke, lowering blood pressure acutely can worsen the infarct and worsen stroke symptoms. This occurs as the ability of the brain to regulate blood flow after a stroke is impaired. And as you can see in the image on the right, so this graph shows the relationship of blood pressure and blood flow in the brain. In normal individuals, blood flow to the brain is maintained at the same level despite blood pressure changes between 50 to 150 millimeter mercury. However, after a stroke, this autoregulation is often lost as the arteries sometimes will fail to constrict or dilate on demand. So patients are often dependent on blood pressure to maintain a stable blood flow to the brain during the initial acute stages of stroke. Some individuals will be more susceptible to stroke due to poor collateral flow, which means the presence of arteries in the same supplying the same area. Certain individuals possess good collaterals, which can limit brain damage after a stroke. Some stroke symptoms are dependent on blood pressure, which may fluctuate if blood pressure is lowered right away. This is the reason why providers may elect to allow blood pressure to be high during the initial stages of stroke, which is a process called permissive hypertension. After a stroke, lowering of blood pressure is indicated when blood pressure exceeds more than 220 over 120. Again, we need the patient's blood pressure to be high during an acute stroke to maintain a steady blood flow to the brain. For patients who were given a clot buster called intravenous TPA, which is a chemical agent given if a stroke patient is seen within 4.5 hours from symptoms onset, and if with no medical contraindication, blood pressure is maintained below 180 over 105. So this is done to lower the risk of bleeding, which can be a complication after receiving TPA or after the artery is reopened. For patients with acute stroke, waiting 24 hours or those who are neurologically unstable. So after the acute phase of stroke, which is typically after three to five days, current American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association guidelines recommend initiating or restarting antihypertensive treatment for patients with a history of stroke and an established blood pressure of more than 140 over 90. Antiplatelet therapy continues to be the default antithrombotic approach for secondary stroke prevention for most stroke subtypes. There are four subtypes of ischemic stroke or causes of stroke, and this includes small vessel stroke, which are typically caused by hypertension or diabetes, large vessel stroke, or stroke affecting any arteries of, of the head and neck, 
uh, that, that is more than two millimeters. We, this includes carotid stenosis and intracranial stenosis. Cardioembolic stroke is another subtype which includes atrial fibrillation, presence of thrombus in the heart, and the other subtype is cryptogenic stroke, which are strokes of unknown cause. So this represents a good portion, which is 30%. Antiplatelets are usually effective in ischemic stroke subtypes, which include small vessel stroke, large vessel stroke, and cryptogenic uh, stroke types, but not for cardioembolic stroke. So for cardioembolic stroke, anticoagulation is recommended. During the acute phase of stroke, Aspirin dosed at 160 to 325 milligrams daily is recommended, and subsequently switch to aspirin 81 milligrams daily during the chronic phase, which is usually after about uh, three weeks or so. Combination of aspirin and clopidogrel can also be used during the acute phase and continued for about three weeks. Chronic use of dual antiplatelets or two antiplatelets is not recommended due to increased bleed risk for the majority of individuals. Agronox or combination of dipyridamol and aspirin is not recommended during the acute phase, but can be effective during the chronic phase of stroke. So anticoagulation therapy uh, use, such as uh, use of Coumadin or the newer agents called direct oral anticoagulants. Uh, and this includes um, apixaban, Pradaxa, edoxaban, rivaroxaban, are used for patients suspected to have cardioembolic stroke. These cardioembolic indications include patients with atrial fibrillation, um, known left atrial or left ventricular thrombus, acute anterior SD segment elevation, myocardial infarction with anterior apical akinesis or dyskinesis, mechanical left ventricular assistive device, left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 35%, and valvular heart disease, including patients with rheumatic mitral valve disease or mechanical prosthetic heart valves in the aortic or mitral position. While antithrombotic therapy impacts the processes involved in formation of clot and thrombosis, cholesterol lowering therapy works by targeting pathways that are involved in development and progression of atherosclerosis. So stands such as atorvastatin block a key enzyme involved in cholesterol synthesis. One study called SPARKLE, which stands for Stroke Prevention by Aggressive Reduction in Cholesterol Levels Trial, demonstrated the benefit of high-dose statin in reducing stroke risk by 2.2% over five years compared to placebo. Another approach of lowering cholesterol is with the use of acetamide, which is a medication that blocks absorption of cholesterol from the small intestine, thereby lowers cholesterol levels in the bloodstream. Azetamide may be an option for patients who cannot tolerate stents, as stents can sometimes lead to muscle pain. It can also be used for patients who fail to achieve adequate LDL cholesterol lowering uh, drug, such as when the LDL or bad cholesterol remains uh, high, which is defined as more than or equal to 70 milligrams per DL. Another agent that can be used for lowering cholesterol is a monoclonal antibody called PSCK9 inhibitor. It can activate a liver enzyme that inactivates LDL receptors, thereby lowering cholesterol levels. So as mentioned earlier, um, diabetes mellitus is an important risk factor for stroke and current secondary stroke prevention guidelines recommend screening for diabetes mellitus. In the acute setting, a study called SHINE, which uh, stands for Stroke Hyperglycemia Insulin Network Effort, compared the effects of intensive blood sugar management with IV insulin compared with sliding scale insulin after an ischemic stroke, but it did not show significant differences in functional outcomes or early recurrent stroke. In fact, hypoglycemic episodes occurred more frequently in the intensive treatment group and increased morbidity. It is therefore recommended that a blood sugar target of 140 to 180 milligrams per deciliter be employed during the acute stroke phase. So just keep it in moderation. All right, so in, in conclusion, 90% of all first stroke can be prevented with risk factor modification. The majority of us can truly control our destiny. 
And this emphasizes the importance of reinforcing healthy lifestyle options or choices in childhood and screening for modifiable risk factors in young and middle-aged adults. Let us relearn new habits and, and break away from what we thought was normal. So finishing a plate when you're really not necessary. So thanks again for listening, and I hope you learned something from this talk. Um, I will now answer your questions if you have any. And should you have any um, uh, additional uh, inquiries, you can also access uh, the American Stroke Association website at www.stroke.org. Um, you'll, you'll see a ton of information there. Again, thank you. And uh, please ask your questions if you have one. All right, so let me just pause this. For recommended that I answer your question. All right, um, I guess that concludes our uh, the discussion. Does anyone have any questions? If you have any questions, you can use the Q&A function to submit them. That's at the bottom of your screen. Let's see here. All right, I guess um, that's it for today. If you have any questions, and if you if you are interested to learn more about uh, um, stroke prevention and lifestyle modification, again, you know, please access uh, our website at the American Stroke Association, www.stroke.org. Uh, there's a ton of information there.